is Andrew Toth. I'm the coordinator of the Student Advisory Board here at the Dole Institute of Politics. I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I have a few reminders before we get started here. First of all, please turn off your cell phone so we don't have that interrupting you. Second of all, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the program. If you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll have a student staffer come to you with the microphone. An example of why we do that. <clears throat> Third, ask just one question and there's no filibustering. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce a uh, professor of political science here at KU, uh, Dr. Eric Heron, who's currently on leave at the Ni National Science Foundation. Thank you. At the time of the Soviet Union's collapse 20 years ago, many thought that democracy would spread to the farthest reaches of the crumbling empire. Some post-Soviet societies initially advanced toward democracy, but others quickly descended into chaos and violence. Authoritarian rulers emerged from disorder in many countries, including oil-rich Azerbaijan. Under the rule of an autocrat who was succeeded by his son, Azerbaijan, a country bordering Russia to the north and Iran to the south, navigated a treacherous foreign policy environment and lost a territorial war with neighboring Armenia. Dissenting opinions were repressed at home. Although many prominent opposition activists attempt to sp attempted to speak out about the lack of freedom. After two decades of independence, some of the strongest critics of the regime have emerged not from political parties, established opposition groups, or from traditional media outlets, but from among the generation of young people who communicate via social media. The regime's reaction to youth activists has required perseverance and integrity. And our guest tonight embodies both qualities. Arzu Gebulayeva has been at the forefront of using blogs, Facebook, and Twitter to inform and mobilize pro-democracy advocates in Azerbaijan uh, and elsewhere. This activism has come at a price for her and a price for her colleagues, which she will talk about tonight. Arzu will be interviewed by Dole Institute Director Bill Lacey. It's my great privilege to welcome to the Dole Institute and to the University of Kansas, Arzu Gebulayeva. Thank you all for coming out, Arzu. Uh, let's start with uh, kind of early years. Tell us where you were raised, uh, a little bit about your family and about your education. Um, I was born in Baku, Azerbaijan, and raised in Baku. I uh, was a very, I was a tomboy. I always loved to play with Legos and boys, play football. I was never into girly toys or anything like that. Um, I later got into a music school, which was shocked my parents because they thought I had no kind of, that kind of talent. Um, I played violin and piano as my main instrument uh, throughout the high school. And I, um, uh, I think it was, it, was a, it was a shocker for them when I started dancing as well. So I had a multiple of things going on when I was a child. I, I had uh, music school, I had normal school, I had dance school education. And um, yeah, I grew up. First, I wanted to be a doctor. That was my dream when I was, a, uh, was, was still in school. My mom is a doctor, so I always wanted to be like her. Um, and uh, though I wanted to be a, a, a pediatrician, that was my, that was my, uh, my dream. And then I decided that I wanted to be a diplomat sometime around high school. That was when I thought, no, oh, you know, it sounds so cool, even though I had no idea what it was about. I just really liked the sound of it, diplomat. And um, uh, so that was, that was up until I realized uh, that, you know, if I want to become a diplomat, I have to study international relations. And without telling anything, um, without asking for advice from my parents, I said, I want to study international relations. And uh, my dad tried to, you know, kind of push me around, say, you know, international relations, a girl, you know, you're from Azerbaijan, you know, you don't really know what you're going to do after that. 
And um, I said, no, I still want to study international relations. And so when I was choosing universities, I, um, I had that in mind. I was very straightforward on that. And um, actually, I studied uh, in Turkey. So when I was graduating from high school, I was in my senior year, I had an opportunity to take university entrance exams um, to study in Turkey, to, my, to do my undergraduate there. And so I, I only had international relations as my choice on all, the, uh, on all the choices, and I got in. So I did study international relations. And after that, I went on to do a master's in global politics, and then working in, in, in different organizations, um, pretty much, yeah. What were some of the organizations you worked with? Uh, my first job uh, had nothing to do with politics, had nothing to do with international relations. I was working for a uh, London-based consultancy company in Istanbul. Uh, the reason why I, I chose to do that, A, I was straight after uh, out of college. I, I really wanted to start working, and I wanted to stay in London when I, when I finished my master's degree, but it was very hard. I couldn't find any, um, any internships or any job opportunities, and when I um, had this interview, and uh, when I heard about the company, they were doing uh, market research in the Middle East, in North Africa, and some of the uh, previous Soviet Union countries. I thought, well, you know, this might be an interesting thing to try. And, um, you know, I was going to live in Istanbul. Why not? And uh, so, yeah, that was my first, uh, my first experience. Um, then, after that, I, I started working with a um, Berlin-based think tank um, uh, that was doing originally work in the Balkans. Uh, and then they decided to start up uh, work in the Caucasus in 2007. And so at that time, uh, they were looking for analysts who would be working for them in uh, Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. And um, I, I applied for that position. And so I was with them for, for, for about two years. I was doing research in the country, uh, which actually resulted, initially our research was on gender development, but then our end result had nothing to do with gender, it was on democracy and we ended up publishing a report on freedom of expression um, just, just this year. Um, and then I moved to Baku, to Azerbaijan. I decided that it was a perfect time, and I had a really interesting opportunity. I was offered a position uh, to work with National Democratic Institute to work on their uh, program that was designed for young leaders, to educate young leaders. Uh, it, the program itself was called Emerging Leaders Program. And so I was there for a brief time to basically design the, the, the scout of the program. Um, the, the courses that we're going to teach, the material that we're going to do, how we're going to run the whole thing. Um, and then I, I, I moved back to Istanbul and uh, been working freelancer ever since. So doing, still doing some uh, jo journalism work, uh, doing a lot of social media work, so writing um, trainings, um, uh, course materials, uh, doing some analyst work, doing some consultancy work. And most recently, I've joined a um, NGO, a small NGO that does conflict resolution work, uh, working with young people from Armenia and Azerbaijan, um, uh, having dialogue review programs. And we have um, two publications. We have an online publication, an online policy journal called Caucasus Edition. And we have a blog-like uh, website called The Nurture Zone, where we have younger writers write on the social issues uh, in Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, and I edit uh, the, uh, the, the blog. So yeah, this is, in brief, what I've been doing. Okay. Yeah. How did you become a social and political activist? Um, it all started uh, in 2008, when I started up a blog. Um, it was, I, I was thinking of, I had my own opinion about Azerbaijan, uh, except I, I, I only shared it with my friends or uh, with my peers, and, and it, I never, you know, thought that I will write about this, or will be writing about this online and sharing with the wider community. Um, I, I was prompted by a friend of mine, a, a good friend of mine from Baku, who said, okay, you know, you have to start up a blog. And back then I had no idea about blogs. I mean, yes, I knew that they existed, I knew that people wrote about things under blogs, but you know, I never thought that I'm going to be one of the bloggers. And I think this was, this was the, the, the year when I became um, socially involved in, um, in, in writing about Azerbaijan and talking about Azerbaijan and making sure that there's more, um, more is out there, to sharing a lot of different reports and statements and developments about the country. So yeah, 2008 uh, was, the, was the year for me. 
And why did you choose to follow this? Why did you choose to get into it? What was your motivation? My motivation, it was, it was a number of different things. Um, uh, I, 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 I felt that I had this privilege, you know, I, I felt that, you know, I've been educated abroad, you know, I've um, had many things given to me that a lot of my peers didn't have in, in the country, in Azerbaijan, and I felt that I had to use this opportunity and not to waste it away, and for me, using this opportunity was to start saying things that were making me concerned, that uh, made me realize that okay, some something some things are wrong, and I have to talk about them. And um, I decided that in one way or another, I have to I have to find this 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 way to 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 share that. And um, this is why I mean I felt that I have to do this because no one or you know it has to be done. And what do you blog about, and what do you strongly believe in? What was it that? You know, chose you to, to, to follow this route. Well, the blog initially uh, it w it wasn't it wasn't serious blog. It was the name sounded very cool. It's called Flying Carpets and Broken Pipelines, um, and uh, it's uh, you know first it was about a random things. You know, I, I wrote about nightlife in Istanbul. I wrote about my observations of things in Azerbaijan. Um, it was. It was a specific event uh, that really made my, pop, uh, my blog popular. Um, it was um, when a local um, online news outlet um, was uh, shut down. But it didn't shut down. It was just like, you know, one day I woke up when I was reading in the news, and the website, I, wouldn't be able, I, I wasn't able to open the website. Um, and at first, there were some rumors that um, uh, they were going to shut down the website completely. Uh, because it was one of the objective, uh, more or less objective media outlets um, out there. And um, then we've learned that the, they were trying to change the, the guy who was running the website because they didn't like what the website was publishing about the government. Um, so the first critical post, uh, really critical of the, the changes of, of this freedom of expression situation in Azerbaijan, was related to that website. I wrote a post, initial post, saying, you know, they're saying that they're changing banners or they're saying that it's under construction, but all of this is not true. What is actually happening is that they're trying to do some of the things that they've already done to other media outlets uh, that were there in Azerbaijan before. And in one of the posts related to that, um, to that event, I, I, I wrote something like this. I said, you know, um, Azerbaijani people are a flock of sheep. Uh, they will just follow the the pastor, they won't do, uh, they won't say, they won't step out of the, of the flock. And um, someone copied that particular post and sent it to the mailing list of the embassies and other international um, organizations that were based in Baku at that time. And so I was in Istanbul, actually, uh, going out with some of my friends who were visiting town. And I get a phone call from a friend of mine from Baku saying that you won't believe, you know, what's happening right now. And, and I asked him what's happening, and he's a, he, he told me that someone copied this and distributed it through emails, and everyone is reading what you wrote. Everyone is saying that, you know, this, this, this girl called Azerbaijani people sheep. <laughs> she called them the flock of sheep. And it was a huge thing for them. And um, this is basically how uh, I got on the mailing list of the embassies. Now my blog as well as several other blogs that are written in English uh, are on the media um, page of the, of, the, of the embassies that they, they follow uh, uh, our blogs and what we publish. So that was the, the turning point in, um, in my blog mm -hmm. that made it so popular. How has your gender affected your work as an activist? Um, not at all. I think for once it also, it, it just I think it startles some people that, you know, I'm a woman and I, I do this activist work because it's not common. I mean, when you look at the, uh, um, at the opposition itself, you have a lot of men on the opposition. And young activists, you have a lot of male young activists. But it's changing now. I mean, I see a lot of uh, girls, uh, young women, who are speaking their minds and who are going to rallies, who are holding protests, who are you know, brave enough 
to speak out. Uh, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's, it's affected me that much. Actually, it, it's, it's to the benefit, because in Azerbaijan, police is not ready to arrest women yet. Uh, they do say that you should shut up, but they're not ready to, to, to imprison you yet. So I think that's played to our advantage, well, so far. Okay. <laughs> Tell everybody where you live and why. Where, where I live? Mm -hmm. uh, I live right now in Istanbul. Uh, I live there because uh, my husband is, is Turkish. Uh, uh, we got married last year. Uh, so yeah, if you ever come to Istanbul, let me know. I would love to show you around. When was the last time you were in, uh, in your home country? Last time uh, I was home was um, last year, December. And uh, I haven't been back uh, since. Um, it's, it's related to my political activism. I will tell uh, the, the story that ha that's behind this. Um, so for a while, there was a lot of uh, kind of debate among our friends inspired by the Arab Revolution, um, you know, thinking of, of, of having bring it to Azerbaijan. And um, having a protest on a street is a really hard thing to organize in Azerbaijan. Uh, police cracks down immediately, and you know you might get arrested. You, it's it's a it's a very uh, uh, risky uh, thing to do. Um, so, what we thought, well, what a friend of mine thought was uh, to start up a Facebook page and um, give it a name: March 11th, uh, Great Azerbaijani People Day. It was it was something like that. Um, it first started with a Twitter hashtag. Uh, my friend Elnur contacted me, who lives in Strasbourg, and he asked me to start up a hashtag on Twitter because I had um, a lot of followers, and he thought it would be a good way to kind of feel the ground, you know, how people are going to react to March 11th hashtag. Um, and then he started up the Facebook page. But what he didn't tell me is that when he was starting up the Facebook page, he was going to put up names as organizers of the Facebook page, the creators of the Facebook so I learned, once the Facebook page is created, that my name is on the list of the seven people, of the people who are, well, creators of the Facebook page, but creator of a Facebook page doesn't mean anything for a government. If you're there, it means that you're, you know, plotting something against the government. In fact, this is what they blame me with when they were writing about me in the newspapers after that. Um, and uh, it was when, um, I think it was March, Eighth. I'm not really sure. I, I got a phone call from my, my, from my father, which I, I, I never do. I mean, he, he's been supporting my work, and he's been you know, very open about his opinion about the leadership. But it was the first time when he called me, and he said, where are you, and where are you going to be on March 11th? And uh, I, w I was shocked. I mean, yes, my dad is on Facebook, and yes, we're friends on Facebook, but this, <laughs> this was a, completely, uh, a complete shocker for me. I was like, well, I'm, I'm actually going to see a movie right now. I'm, I'm in Istanbul. I'm not, I'm not in Azerbaijan. He's like, well, good. You're not going there for a while. And um, I, asked, I, said, I said, why? He's like, well, I got a phone call from several people concerned about your security, so you're definitely like, going home for a couple of months. And um, you know, I, 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 I was like, are you serious? They take a Facebook group page so seriously? He's like, well, you don't, obviously, you, know, you don't realize how serious things are. And it was around the same time when the only person of those seven people was, uh, who was in Azerbaijan. His name is Bakhtiyar. He was called in for questioning uh, the first time before the, 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 Facebook, before the March 11th, but the, the pages already existed. He was, he was let go, and then he was called in again um, two days later, I believe, and then he got arrested on that day. So when he was going there for the second time, he knew that something was going to happen, and he actually put it up on his Facebook status page. He said, look, I'm, I'm called in again. It probably means I'm going to get arrested. Be prepared and know what you're going to do. And you know, it was kind of a, a drill that we already knew, uh, because in 2009, we had two of our friends got arrested, uh, uh, that I'll tell uh, in a little bit. So we kind of knew that, okay, if he gets arrested, we know what we're going to do. We're going to you know, tweet, we're going to uh, contact international organizations and see what we can do. He is now in prison for two years. 
And the sentence that he is in prison is not because of his political work. It's never is about political um, activism when they arrest you in Azerbaijan. It's always either about hooliganism, it's about drug possession, it's about anything but political activism. They know that if they put you in prison for political activism, it's going to have its toll. Um, so he was charged with evading military service. And the reason why they charged him with that was because now he had his law degree at Harvard and he was just back in Azerbaijan um, trying to continue his research in Georgia when on the train from Baku to Tbilisi, he got stopped on the border uh, before leaving Baku, on the, on the border between Baku and Tbilisi, and uh, was escorted by the police uh, back to his hometown uh, where he was told that you are on the list, you have to uh, uh, go to the army. And he was like, well, actually, I won't be going to the army because I'm applying for an alternative military service. It's my right. And technically, the, the law on alternative military service hasn't been approved in the parliament, but it is in the parliament. It's been discussed. So using that as his card, he said, look, I want to do that. I don't want to go to the military service. I still have my education to continue. And they said, OK, well, until further notice, you're going to stay in your hometown which is another big city in Azerbaijan called Ganja, and you will be under police surveillance. And that's what it was. He had to report every day to the police station that he was in town, that he was in living town. So anyway, he was the only one of all the seven people who was in Azerbaijan, and he got arrested. And now we, we, we don't know when he's going to get released. We hope that he will be released soon, but it's, we don't know. Um, and so basically, that's what got me into trouble as well. Um, I, I haven't been able to go home. The only positive news that I've learned um, by now is that my name is not on the border, um, on the list of suspicious people that could get arrested on the border. So at least I can actually cross the border and enter the country, which I have to because my passport is out of pages and I have to get a new passport, even though my passport is actually valid for the next, what, eight years. But because uh, we don't add pages into passport, uh, I have to uh, go back and get a new passport. Okay. So hopefully, hopefully I'll be, I plan on going to Azerbaijan in, in January next year, so. Okay. How have you used social media to inform and mobilize pro-democracy advocates? Um, it's, it's, uh, it's been kind of going on, on two different levels. So my blog, um, I've been mostly writing on the internal situation in the country and all the human rights issues and freedom of expression issues. And then um, as, as, as a means to inform uh, the international audience. And then at home, uh, Facebook, actually Facebook and Twitter have become more um, used by activists after an incident in 2009. Uh, something that I mentioned earlier when two of our friends, also bloggers and activists, got arrested uh, in Azerbaijan, the case of the famous donkey bloggers. I don't know if any of you heard about them. Uh, Go ahead and before. tell the story, yeah. because probably most of them haven't heard. I hadn't heard it until I was prepping for this. So. Okay. So their case is called donkey bloggers. And the reason why they're called donkey bloggers um, has a very funny story to it. So in 2009, um, our, our government, well, the Ministry of Agriculture, buys a donkey from Germany, one donkey, for 47,000 euros. <laughs> so, you know, it kind of goes into the press. We read about this and like, okay, you know, it must be a very special donkey. If it's 47,000 euros. You know, the, the, the explanation behind that in the press was that, you know, we need uh, good donkeys for the agricultural purposes. Hence, they were buying this very super expensive donkey from, from Germany. And so what I mean that Adnan did, and I'll, I'll, before I go into the story, I'll tell you who both of them are. Emin Mili, he is a founder of uh, a youth movement called um, Azerbaijan Network, uh, which is basically a network of students uh, who've studied abroad, who've been back, or who still live um, in Europe. And uh, he is more of this like intellectual, very philosophical um, young man who you know who always believes into change. You know, his motto was always you know the change. You know, you, you, we can bring the change. We can make this change happen. Um, and Adnan is the founder of another youth movement called All in Azerbaijani, which means to be. 
And you know, with all has been doing a lot of um, activism at home on the ground, where Anne was more of like an intellectual level, mm -hmm. and they've been organizing a lot of different lectures together as well. And what happened all at the end, um, they formed this interesting university concept, uh, which is called Open um, no, Free Thought University, which holds lectures uh, twice a week, uh, inviting different speakers from different background, from different professional background, uh, you know, giving lectures. And it's open to public. Anyone could come. It's advertised on Facebook. And um, so what, what, what we, they've created basically an alternative place for students, for many students, to come and listen to lectures that they normally don't get to have in the universities. Because you know, univer the Azerbaijani University is a very old school, you know, Soviet oriented, you know, everything has to be memorized, everything has to be written in the memorized way, you know. Everything is by the book and you know, professors are not really open to uh, free thinking, to analytical thinking, you know, you're not really allowed to pose questions that are not part of this curriculum, basically. And so for them, you know, Free Thought University is a place where they can challenge that, you know, where they're able to talk about things that they normally are not allowed to in their universities. Um, so back to the story. And so what they do, um, they, they order a donkey outfit, and um, they decide to do a satirical video. They dress someone with a donkey outfit, and uh, the video starts with uh, the donkey giving a press conference. And uh, so there are a couple of journalists sitting at a table, and, uh, and, the, and the donkey is um, introduced as Mr. Heisel, because he's from Germany, and they interview him. And so the, basically the, the idea was to, to, to show why this donkey was so expensive, you know. So this donkey spoke several languages, including Azerbaijani. This donkey played violin. The, he actually gives a violin concert in, in the video. You know, he was very knowledgeable. And he answers uh, some of the questions in the video. And, and, and one of the questions is, you know, Mr. Heise, you know, if you were born a donkey again, where would you like to be born? And Mr. Heisel says, of course I would like to be born in Azerbaijan, because Azerbaijan is a perfect place for donkeys, because donkeys can do whatever they want here. And so there was a lot of reference to the, the situation in, on, in the country, and you know, it, was, it was hilarious. Everyone loved it. Well, we loved it. <laughs> Not everyone apparently loved the video. Um, because in 2000, because that very same year, um, in the summer, they, uh, Emin and Adnan, got together with some of our friends and went to have dinner at a local restaurant in Baku. Um, they were attacked uh, that night by two men they didn't know, um, beaten. And when the men ran away, Emin and Adnan decided to go to the police uh, station to report on what happened. Um, they went to one police station. They said that the, the restaurant was not under their jurisdiction and that they had to go to another police station. And when they got there, they saw the two guys that beat them up. And they realized that something must have been wrong. Something was, it, this was a setup. But they, they didn't realize it until, uh, until the moment when they saw the two guys who beat them up let go from the police station. Because initially when they came in, the, the debate from what Adnan and Amin uh, tells us now is that the guys were very afraid, the people who beat them up, the two, the, the, the two men, and they asked him not to press charges. Uh, Amin and Adnan said, okay, we'll write the statement because we have to report this, we got beaten up, but if, you know, if it goes to the court, we'll say, okay, you know, as long as you apologize, we'll, we'll be fine. But you know, it, it doesn't happen that way. Um, the, the, the two men that beat them up are released from the prison, from the back door, from the police station, from the back door. And Amin did not get uh, detained for two days until there's a court uh, two days later, uh, and they were not allowed to contact their lawyers. This all happened behind the closed doors. Um, in the court, they were sentenced to two months of pretrial detention on the charges of hooliganism and inflicting body harm, intentional body harm. And these guys couldn't prove that it was not them who beat those men up. Because those men who beat them up, the two, two, two guys, they were twice bigger 
Lenny Mina did not. They were from the Sports Academy, which is known for its thugs, basically. Um, and no one listened to them. And uh, there was a court hearing, several court hearings. And this whole case dragged till November. So from June till November. And in November, they were sentenced. <coughs> and Adnan was sentenced to two years. Amin was sentenced to two and a half years based on hooliganism. This was the official line. None of the evidence, none of the evidence worth taking into account. And the whole court, I mean, every single hearing, I was, I was at NDI at some point uh, when the hearings were still, because when they were in prison, uh, the, uh, the, the lawyers applied for, um, uh, again, for hearings to, to get them out. So I was, I was actually at the hearings when they were already in prison. And it was, it was a complete fake. The judge, the police officers, the witnesses, it was just, you know, you, you felt how they're playing with you and you couldn't do anything. Um, so it was, you know, it was the moment, you know, their arrest in, in the summer, for, for me personally, it was like, you know, we have, to do the, we have to do something about this. You know, I was already blogging, it was a year into my blogging, I was quite outspoken and it's just, you know, there was no way, I, I, I couldn't believe th that a, I couldn't believe the news that they were arrested. The day when I opened, uh, I, I, I opened Facebook and then I see status updates from my friends saying Amin and Adnan are arrested. And for a while I thought this was not, you know, they will be released. This is, this is what many people in Azerbaijan, many of our friends thought. And when they actually pronounced the sentence, we were shocked. We were really shocked. And um, we realized that, okay, you know, we have to mobilize, we have to do something about this case. And, um, you know, I continued writing. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of people in Baku were contacting international organizations, newspapers. You know, at the end of I mean, I don't think the government really thought through of what it's going to cost them because we really did damage their reputation abroad. You know, we had um, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton make a statement and actually publicly ask our president Hamaliyev to release. I mean, Adnan from prison. She was in Baku uh, the next summer, uh, you know, telling this to the president. You know, it was all over the newspapers. It was in many international reports. So I think the government, when they thought that by arresting Amin Adnan, they're going to silence the youth, they're going to silence activists, they actually, you know, triggered this. We didn't know that it existed, but it triggered this kind of united front almost. Yes, there were a lot of people who moved away from us. You know, a lot of people that we thought were our friends, they just disappeared. A lot of um, kind of formations that we thought would be supporting um, our statements, would be signing under each of our petition, um, didn't. Um, and that was it, was, it was a harsh reality check, but it also, you know, we appreciated that because at the end of the day, it opened our eyes. We knew who is actually there with us. And now a lot of the people who turn from us are trying to come back to the friendship that we had before, especially with Amin and Adnan. But of course it's not the same because you, you've, seen the, you've seen how they basically, I get, they just got scared because I, I, I couldn't understand why they would get scared, you know, because there are implications. You know, your parents might lose their jobs. You might get kicked out of university. You might own yourself lose your job. There are very serious implications for that. But again, you know, it's do you really prefer your job when your friend is in prison, or do you do something about this? Um, so yeah, this was this was really, I think, the trigger, um, and and not just for me, for the for just the um, social media, like online activism. This was the the, the year when. A lot of people started looking at Facebook and Twitter and blogs as means to um, to talk about what was happening in Azerbaijan. How do you feel about the way that the United States and Europe have engaged with the government in Azerbaijan? Or not engaged, or not engaged. <laughs> in the government. What's your view of that? Um, I was recently, I actually wrote a blog post about the European factor recently. I was in Brussels having meetings with uh, parliament members. And um, I, was, uh, I, I, was, I was in a meeting with the head of the Social Democrat Party. And he openly said that 
you know, as long as Azerbaijan has oil and gas, Europe won't be able to do anything because it's much easier to use carrots than sticks when it comes to Azerbaijan. And, you know, yes, it was, it was a very kind of like a slap <laughs> in your face that here, there you go, you know, we've said it openly because, you know, this was kind of, everyone understood what was happening. You know, you've, you've had this situation for the last 20 years in this country. You know, you've had a situation when journalists have been arrested, political active has been arrested, you know, opposition can't have a voice in anything. We haven't had a free <laughs> election since the fall of the Soviet Union. You know, we had a one election when we have elected the president with the majority, which was the only democratic election we had, and he was basically brought down by Heydar Aliyev. And ever since, you know, he's been replaced by his son. His son managed to change the constitution just because he wanted to. His wife can demolish houses of people just because she wants to have Winter Boulevard for the Eurovision contest next year. You know, this is the country that Azerbaijan has become, and the, the, the highest criticism that you get is that, you know, yes, Azerbaijan is deteriorating, yes, uh, you know, things are wrong, but in action, nothing happens. And it also has to do, you know, it, it comes to the same, it's Europe and the U.S. There's not been a single, you know, a statement that involved some action. I mean, Council of Europe, it has never even made a hint of uh, denouncing a Zerbitin's membership. And this is Council of Europe. You know, you would think that this is the, you know, a lot of us have had hope. You know, when Emin and I got arrested, we, we said, okay, you know, if, he, he, you know, U.S. is making statements, if Europe is making statements, this is going to make a change in, 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 in their approach to Azerbaijan. But it was a shocker because you know, no one cares. You know, everyone has, oh, that's what the guy said. Someone else from the, from the parliament said, you know, we in Europe and our people in Europe have also human needs and human rights. And, you know, people want to be warm in winter in their homes. And it's like, <laughs> are you, what are you talking about? You, you, you know, this is, these are the people's lives we're talking about. You know, we have, we had a journalist who was in prison in 2007 for his critical writing who was released basically as a result of the decision issued by the European Court of Human Rights. And even then, the government managed not to release him from prison just because they gave him an additional two and a half year of prison months before the decision from the European Court of Human Rights came out. And you know, it's, it's, it's I, I just don't, I, I, I don't understand how can you not do anything just for the sake of staying warm in winter? Do you find, um that most uh, young people share your views about democracy, or is it more of a generational difference with older people, or just you know, kind of define who the pro-democracy people in Azerbaijan are? Well, um, not all, not every single young person in Azerbaijan thinks like me. There are a lot of uh, young people who don't care, you know, who care about phones, expensive cars, and nice lives. They don't care about talking about the situation. They don't care about doing something about the situation. There are those young people who support the, the government. You know, they are from the uh, pro-government youth movement, uh, something similar to Russia's Nashik. I don't know if you've heard about it, but Russia has a very large uh, youth movement called Nashik. And so we have a similar version of that. In fact, uh, Russia's Nashik people come to Azerbaijan to train uh, the youth movement that's similar to Nashik in Azerbaijan. Um, so you have very disfragmented um, young population, and even including the, the, the group that is pro-change, the group that is heavily critical of the government, even within that group, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, split in, in thinking because, you know, um, there, there's this group of activists who think that, you know, getting arrested is the best thing that they could do because it's so cool. You know, you go on the street, you say freedom, and you get arrested, and then your name is in the paper, and they think this is, they, they see the change in, in, in that kind of activity. And you know, it's very hard to explain to them that, look, it's not, it's not about that. You, know, it's a little, it's, you have to think beyond, beyond that. You have to think how, of how not get arrested and yet manage to save freedom or you know, we want change. Um, and so you know, when, you, when you kind of try to, I, I can never say the numbers, but I, I wouldn't say that there are, there's a big, big uh, portion 
the students uh, are the ones who are in majority because they're unhappy with the education, because of the corruption in the education system. Um, but again, even, even they are not very outspoken. So I would say, you know, optimistic a couple hundreds. I would want to say a couple thousands, but I don't want to say a couple thousands because I haven't seen a couple thousands, you know. Couple thousands on Facebook, you know. When you create a mm -hmm. Facebook page, like mm -hmm. our March 11th Facebook page, it had 4,000 people who responded positively that they would attend, but maybe only 100 showed up. Mm. You know, mm. it's it's the 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 understanding of of, of 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 a rally. I mean, people are so much they're threatened by the fact of they they're threatened by the consequences of what might happen to them if they go to the street if they if they protest because they know that they get arrested, because they know that you know, police is, is, some of the photographs from the, the, recent, um, the recent series of protests, you know, in March, in April, um, the religious movement um, protests. I mean, there, there are photos of you know, five police officers carrying just one guy and not letting him walk. They literally just carry them and shove them into the police cars and take them to the police station. You know, there's that kind of treatment. You know, it's not a hum humane treatment of, okay, if you're arresting someone, at least do it with some dignity, you know? There are some, there are some photos of, of, of men literally like being dragged uh, to, the, to the police cars and, you know, people are afraid of that. Uh, people are afraid of losing their jobs if they go to, to a protest. And the same with students. A lot of young people are afraid that they're going to get kicked out of the universities. What do you believe is gonna happen in your country over the next 10 years? In, in this respect? Well, we have presidential elections uh, coming up in 2013. Optimistically, I am for some reason hopeful that we will have, that we might have perhaps uh, an election uh, because I'm hoping that there will be different candidates uh, running for the presidential uh, seat. Now this is, very optimistic, <laughs> because um, sometimes I go back into the pessimistic thinking that you know he's going to get elected again because he did remove a, a presidential term when they changed the constitution in 2009. Um, so he can basically run technically as many times as he wants, even though legally he can't. The legally, the new change in the constitution only applicable to the new president, but that's a little detail that the government doesn't really care about. Um, I hope what happens, what I would like to see in Azerbaijan is the gradual shift. And I'm not talking about immediate uh, democracy because I know that even, even if we do have democratic elections, if we do have a democratically elected new president, you know, there, is, there are almost two or three generations that have been wasted down the drain precisely because there's been no development in education. And I feel like there's going to be a lot of work that needs to be done to, to change that. You know, we'll have to start basically rebuilding your country from, from, from zero. Hopefully we'll still have the money that we <laughs> do get from oil and gas to do some of those reforms if there, it's not finished <laughs> by that time. Um, I'm hopeful that um, our, the young generation of people uh, who are either you know active now or who are thinking of 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 seeing their country in a different uh, spot, they would understand that you know it's not an easy task that you have to work together because you know you also have this disunited front. You know you have the the op the young branches of opposition parties. They they hate the youth uh, branch of this uh, youth movement. I was, when I was at NDI, I have, I have a story, actually a really interesting story. We were preparing this ELP program, and we called in, uh, we invited a lot of um, political, um, young political uh, party representatives, and the people from the uh, youth movement, pro-government youth movement, to help us design the program, because we didn't want to repeat anything that was already done before, so we basically asked them what they wanted us to teach them. And there were a lot of different ideas circulating, but at some point, the guy from the uh, main opposition party, youth branch, he's like, I won't attend the training given to me by someone from the movement, 
the pro-government youth movement. And we're like, well, he's not preaching you anything. He's giving you a training on how to do accounting for your organization. He's like, no, I won't be doing that. And um, we thought, okay, and, and I was the only woman in the room. So think, think of, a, of a small conference room full of 25 guys and me trying to facilitate that whole discussion. At some point, I don't know, <laughs> I think it was an hour and a half into our discussion, I turned to my colleague and was like, okay, either you do something about this or I am going to shout because they are not listening to me at all. And he's like, okay, relax. And uh, he stood up and said, okay, guys, we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to help you. You, know, we, you kind of need us to help you to work on this together. And we thought that they got the point. We thought that uh, it all worked out until the actual presentation of the program. So we've, we've, we've thought everything well through and we've invited, we made a big, bigger meeting, we invited civil society representatives, we invited young uh, people from the parties, uh, we invited some people from the, from the government institutions. And as I was uh, making the presentation about the program, the guy who heads the opposition youth movement stood up without even asking for, for, you know, for an excuse. And he stood up and said, I won't be sitting in a room with this man. And then he walked out of the meeting. And this is you know, the, the, the level of communication that they have among each other, a level of understanding that they have among each other. Sometimes I think part of my work uh, working at the center uh, uh, doing conflict resolution work you know, is to do a lot of reconciliation and communication. It's like, I think we have to transfer our work to work with these guys <laughs> because obviously they don't know how to reconciliate. They obviously have issues with that. Um, so you know, I hope that in a way will gradually um, dissolve. I hope that there will be cooperation because you know, we all live in the same country. We all want to do certain things and if we don't do it together, you know, whatever we do won't be perhaps as effective. Um, so there, the, the, there's, there's that as well. And also just <coughs> you know, seeing my country not being criticized and having a post on my blog that will be actually writing something positive about my country, not something negative. This is what I hope, but I, again, 10 years, it's a, it's a very short time. Yes. Yeah. I am going to uh, have one more question and I'm gonna open it up to your Q&A. We have a lot of students here tonight, so I, think, I hope you guys will take advantage of this opportunity to ask Arzu any questions that you have, but my final question, Arzu, for you tonight is, um, I think you're in your late 20s, so you're just a few years older than most of the students who are here with us tonight. And here, you know, you started blogging three years ago, if I got the chronology yeah. right. Uh, you live in Turkey and you haven't visited home for almost a year now because you're afraid of being arrested. And what would you say to American students about the importance of them taking an active role in their communities and their, in their country? Well, that's a very big task to, to say something like this, but um, I think what's important, what's important to know is that you have the freedom to, to do things and you have the liberty to do things. And I think these are the two things that you really need to understand and value, you know, because I, I, I always tell the story of, um, of, of, of an event that I attended last year in Poland. It was a conference about, uh, about bloggers. And I was on a panel um, with two very famous uh, Polish bloggers who, and, and the discussion was about the, the freedom that you have as a blogger who doesn't have um, ads on their blog and the freedom that you have or you don't have once you start placing ads. And the reason why they were talking about this is because the guy, one of the two Polish bloggers, was a very famous blogger. He's been making money from his blogs because of the ads that he had. So this whole discussion, at some point they start talking about hamburgers and you know, are you free when you start talking about McDonald's hamburgers? And I took the microphone and said, guys, you're talking about hamburgers. We are talking about arrests. We're talking about you know, imprisonment. 
this is the difference that you and, and we in Azerbaijan have in blogs. For us, blogs are basically a window of an opportunity to, to, to talk about what's happening in Azerbaijan. This whole social media thing is, 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 is an opportunity. Whereas for you, you know, you're, you, you can do whatever you want. You, you, you can talk about hamburgers as much as you want. I don't think talking about hamburger might limit your freedom or their freedom, but you, know, you, you have to understand the, the, the concept. So I think you know, when you bring it, when you kind of boil that down, it's, you know, it's, it's the liberty and the freedom that you have and that you value, that you should value. Because you, know, you, you, can, you can talk about a, a professor who's been fired from the, from the uh, <coughs> football team. You know, but this, the, because this is the freedom. You, know, you, you can talk about these things because you don't have things like human rights issues or like you know, arrested journalists sitting in prison. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Questions? Raise your hand, wait for uh, one of our students to come by. Come on now, guys, you can do better than that. We have one right here. I had an opportunity a few years ago to be in Baku on two different occasions, working on a project for the university, dealing with the educational institutions, higher education, in Azerbaijan, Baku specifically. That was just before the oil pipeline was finished. Money wasn't flowing. Money's been flowing now with the oil. You touched on this just a bit, but I'd like to hear a little bit more. Whether they will be spending the money to upgrade their universities, or whether they'll be spending the money to ensure their place in power. Um, they certainly haven't been spending money to improve um, the education system in Azerbaijan. I, I haven't seen any improvement, to be honest, myself. Um, I feel like the money is spent more on further entrenching the power and further making sure that those who are in power stay in power. Um, the money is spent on useless renovation projects. The money is spent on um, infrastructure that needs renovation a year later. Um, the oil money is definitely not spent on social issues. The money is definitely not spent on healthcare improvement which is another sector that needs big, big investment and big development. <coughs> um, so I don't know how, how you, you saw it when you were there, but right now I feel like it's much worse um, than it was after the, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. Okay. Is the experience that you've had in Azerbaijan paralleled or comparable to what has been experienced with the other republics that have come about now since the downfall of the Soviet Union? Does the experience? Does the experience that you've been having in your home country similar or different from other republics that were part of the so Soviet yeah. Union? The, it's a the, very good question. The experience in terms of um, activists or political development? It seems like that there's a, a real problem to instill what the idea of democracy is to be. Right, um, yes, we, we, we have that issue in common. And it's, uh, it's not, um, and I, I, I see that as a result of the leaders that came to power after, the, after the, these countries declared their independence. Uh, you know, hey, that idea was not a political student, he was not a political science student or international research student, he wasn't a, K, a KGB officer. So he ran the country based on his military or whatever kind of mindset that he had. And I feel like, you know, had we perhaps a, a, a leader, and we did have a leader who was elected democratically a year before that, but the problem with him was that he also wasn't running the country the way he should have run the country. And, and that's one of the many reasons why he basically had to leave. Um, but yes, I think it's a, it's, it's a pattern. I think it's, it's a pattern of, um, of the, the leaders who came um, um, to run those countries. But it's also the, the, the people who have not had the, the idea of democracy because you know, it, it wasn't like it was in Poland or it wasn't like it was in, in Serbia when 
there was a moment when, when, when people said, okay, you know, it's enough. Um, in Azerbaijan, especially, perhaps this was more kind of visible in 2003 and 2005 when we had mass protests after the presidential and parliamentary elections. Um, but yes, I think it's, it's kind of several, several elements related to that. Um, and there is a, and I think that pattern exists in, in other post-Soviet states as well. Other questions? Seems like we have one back in the back. I wonder if you could speak uh, a word about uh, the reaction of other people in Turkey. Since you're in Turkey uh, as sort of a your base for, for blogging now, what is the, the reaction of uh, Turkish folks to people living in Turkey and perhaps uh, doing social activism from there about other countries? What's the reaction of people living in Repeat it Can again, you Nick. Repeat it? If you would, please. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, uh, speak a bit uh, describing the, the reaction of people in Turkey uh, to your doing social activism from there, but about uh, Azerbaijan. Oh. Well, um, I, haven't, I haven't had that many uh, comments or you know, uh, people wanting to talk to me about my work in, in Turkey because Turkey, Turkey's blogosphere itself is not so um, well developed, I would say, as I thought it would be. Um, and so the whole concept of blogosphere is still kind of um, growing. And, uh, you know, there are not that many people who, who know about me or who, who can, uh, can say something about the, the, the work that I do. Um, I could say something, I could add to that um, a, a little bit, just in terms of the Turkey, the whole Turkey uh, reaction as to what's happening in Azerbaijan overall. Um, it hasn't been positive, to be honest. I mean, I haven't seen anything critical coming out of Turkish newspapers uh, criticizing what's happening in Azerbaijan. Perhaps it has to do with the already strained relations between these two countries, even though they constantly call themselves um, one nation, two states. Uh, but it's it's also because um, you know it's it's not it's not on their agenda. Um, I when Emin and Adnan got arrested, I think only one newspaper in Turkey published an article about their arrest. Only one newspaper in the whole of Turkey, um, and that was a huge uh, a huge disappointment as well because you know we we rely so much. On, on Europe and our closest neighbor that we believe is our brother, you know, doesn't say anything about this. So that's, that's probably also is another extent of that um, relationship <coughs> overall. Do we have any other questions? Okay, we have uh, at least two more here. Get this one in the back first. You mentioned that the U.S. and Europe Speak been, up a little, Andrew. You, you mentioned that the U.S. and Europe have been kind of absent and, and haven't spoken out against the Azerbaijani government. Are there countries in the world who have been supportive of, of what you're doing and, and have spoken out uh, against the, the regime in, in Azerbaijan? Um, no. The, most of the time when you have uh, a response to what's happening in Azerbaijan, it comes from organizations. It comes from organizations like Human Rights Watch, like Freedom House, like Amnesty International, Article 19. Um, those are the most critical reports that come about Azerbaijan. But I haven't seen, I haven't heard of any country that would be uh, supportive of openly making statements uh, that would support our work of what we're doing. Okay, we have a question right here. Can you hear me? Of all the Soviet uh, bloc countries, and also the countries that were associated with that Soviet bloc regime, like Mongolia, which one of those countries would you say is the closest to developing a democratic state today? Wow. Um, I don't know. I never thought about this, to be honest. I don't. Which do you, is there one or two that you really admire the direction that they're trying to go, where maybe there is a strong pro-democracy movement that's, you know, where people are actually taking action? Mm. Well, 
I had my hopes up for Georgia. I, I was admired by it briefly. Uh, not necessarily now, <laughs> because not a lot of people like the, the president and his reforms right now. But, um, you know, Ukraine for, for a while with its orange revolution was inspirational. We actually, actually, there was an attempt to have an orange revolution in Azerbaijan as well in 2005 during the parliamentary elections. Um, so I think it's, a, it's bits of, of, of moments, uh, which I don't necessarily think that you know, Ukraine now is doing great or Georgia is doing great, but uh, I think each of those countries had moments when they all kind of inspired, just like the Arab Spring now is, is inspirational for many of the activists in the, in the region. Go for it. You get. You get to wait for the mic, though. Go ahead. Let's get the mic. I don't normally let people ask two questions. But it's not a question. It's a statement. Um, actually, my I don't normally allow statements I know. to make it my, quick. My sister-in-law is from Mongolia, and she's a politician. And they're probably, uh, that was, a, that was a, a question that I was hoping you would answer with Mongolia, uh. because um, they, they have finally elected a Democratic uh, president, right. and that only happened about 18 months ago. So um, it, it's, but there's a lot of education that has to go on, like you were saying, mm -hmm. teaching the people what a democratic state is and how to, how to, uh, how they function and what. So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? We do have one. Actually, we have two more, and then this lady is on the second row is going to be the last one, Kristen. Is, I, I take it that Azerbaijan will ha it has. Muslims or Islam going on is that a are they any do they swing any political power or there is any concern from the, from the government about such such things I uh, so. yeah um, well Azerbaijan um, calls itself a secular democracy uh, it's majority um, Shia uh, but it's it, the government has been very strict um, on the religious um, movements overall. I mean, they, they crush religious protests as badly as they crush democratic or opposition protests. Um, they're very concerned about the influence coming from Iran uh, and the, the, the religious influence supporting the religious movements who are um, Shia. Uh, we also have Sunni um, Muslims in Azerbaijan as well, but she is the majority. Um, there's also the, the threat of the uh, uh, Islam coming from Saudi Arabia, uh, which uh, also is very kind of, you know, the, 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 the beard, the short pants, the government is very, very strict on that. They, I've read somewhere several times where police actually made the, the men shave their beards or um, harass them because of that. So there is a very um, strict uh, non-written policy about religious uh, movements in Azerbaijan, uh, which, which the government <coughs> pursuing quite, quite consistently, because they're they're, they're just afraid of having uh, 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 an Islamic influence. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering what the reaction of women, um, especially in their late twenties and thirties, are to your blog because we think of women in the childbearing ages as being very interested in education and health care for their families. So that might be a way to, a place to start. So what's their reaction? Um, I've, um, I've worked with women um, in the regions. I've actually given trainings to young girls and in north of Azerbaijan um, on social media and writing. And the reason why we've done that was precisely because of what you said, precisely because we thought that young girls at that age would be more interested in doing something about their communities in terms of healthcare and education, especially in regions where you don't have access um, to many um, services that you might get in Baku, for example, private hospitals for, uh, for, for treatment. And so it's still very tricky because uh, when you work with women, and you think that women um, in that group age would be more actively engaged. Um, there is a challenge because Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani society is still uh, very uh, man-oriented. You know, the, the, the father is a decision maker. The brother gets to control his sister's life if, 
they live in a very um, strict uh, family uh, settings. And so, for example, in the regions, I had a, I had an, I, I had a small incident when in the training, we had two girls who came with, um, first we didn't know who the guy was because the, the training was supposed to be just for girls, but for some reason, there were three or four guys in the room. Um, so this guy apparently was the cousin. And the reason why he was there was because the girls were not allowed to be there on their own. Um, and so when I asked her, uh, you know, we did a, a preliminary kind of question and answer session before we started the training because uh, we really wanted to know the level, you know, if they had an email addresses or they knew anything about social media. And so when, we, when I asked them, she said, um, I don't have an email address. I said, well, it's okay. We'll get you an email address at this training. And this guy said, she doesn't need it because I have one. This was his response to the question addressed to her. And was like, well, she still needs an email address. And we had that kind of tension for a moment there. And I said, okay. I, 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 I didn't say anything because then, and the, when he left after lunch, we opened her an email address. We started <laughs> off her blog. And then the funny thing is the next day when we're, when, we're, when we're teaching them how to write stories and how to post things on their blog, for some reason she had a picture of him on her blog. And, and I asked her why. She's like, well, you know, he's my cousin and, you know, he might get angry. I'm like, forget about your cousin. It's about you. It's about your skills. You know, you should know how to do this yourself without his even picture on their blog. And so that's the challenge. To break that kind of stereotype, especially in the regions, um, is, is it's, it's, it's a lot of work. But there is interest because you know when you give those kind of trainings, you don't expect the whole group to to become engaged instantly. You expect that you know out of 20 people, at least five will stay involved. You know you kind of you you, you give yourself a realistic kind of uh, framework, and, and and usually that's how it works. Uh, you know you don't expect full um, follow up, and. Um, some of those girls do stay involved. Some of the girls do projects. Um, and in, in, for readers, for example, I have um, some, of the, the, some of my female friends always comment and say that, you know, we're proud of you because you're writing all of this and you're not afraid because you're a woman. Because most of the time, you know, people would think that, you know, if she's a girl, she might be a little bit afraid of saying things here and there. Um, and this is, you know, it's, it's very inspirational to me as well because I feel like I inspire other women as well and they either talk about their concerns openly or at least they understand the, the, the important role that you're trying to, to do and, and things that you're trying to change. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky way, but it's, 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 there are some developments. Well, I can assure you you've inspired all of us tonight. Thank you very much Thank for you. listening.